Cook Campus Parents Association. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, coming out in the blizzard of 2012 to, uh, to hear our uh, presenters. What we're going to do here this morning is we're going to start with, um, I'm going to introduce each of the presenters just so you know who they are and then uh, and some other people that are active around the uh, in the Rutgers Parents Association. And then we're going to go out, we're going to have a financial aid session in here that probably everybody can uh, use. And then we'll go to the breakout sessions. There's two breakout sessions in case you happen to have a person, you know, like a daughter at DRC who's also an SCBS student or a SAS student. You can go to two different sessions. Um, the, where the sessions will be is the Douglas Residential College group will meet around the cafe area, perhaps in the Merle v. Adams room, which is right there. The um, School of Arts and Sciences session will start here, and then the second session will be upstairs in room 202, 202 and the SEBS or Cook Campus uh, sessions will switch with the SAS. They'll start upstairs in room 202 and then move down here for the second session. Our speakers today are uh, not here yet is uh, Joe Mantola for the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. He's uh, doing what professors have to do to pay the bills. He's teaching class this morning and teaching class again this afternoon. So he's squeezing us in between the, his two classes. Uh, he's Assistant Dean for Academic Research and Programs. And when I take the first group of SEBS students up to room 202, he should be up there waiting for us. From the Douglas Residential College is Lauren Zielinski down here in the front. She's the senior program coordinator for uh, academics and stuff and uh, scholarships. The School of Arts and Sciences will be led by Muffin Lord, who was just here a second ago. <laughs> oh, she's hiding way in the back. Hey. <laughs> Um, she's Assistant Dean for Undergraduate Education and Honors Programs. And then finally, we'll have here Financial Aid, Jean McDonald Rash, from, um, who's the Director of Financial Aid for SAS. She'll uh, lead us in, the, uh, in that presentation. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jean McDonald Rash. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to do other introductions. I, I apologize. Cheryl Grabelny over here in the corner. She's the president of the Rutgers Parents Association. Hiding in the back, all huddled together, is the uh, people from the Rutgers Parents Association. Brian McDonald, Andy Campbell, and, and Barbara Blackwell. And who could not be here this morning is uh, Nancy Jenkins. She's the president of the Douglas Parents Association. Uh, she had a family emergency this morning. So with that, turn it over to Jeannie. Good morning. Thank you for coming out today. Um, as Rich said, uh, my name is Jean McDonald Rash. I'm the University Director of Financial Aid, and actually not just for SAS, um, for all the schools in New Brunswick and operational and compliance responsibilities for our Newark and Camden campuses as well. So um, I brought my slideshow with me, but I will tell you that it was geared toward uh, parents of incoming students. I wasn't really uh, absolutely sure of the audience. But my understanding is that you actually are the parents of continuing undergraduates here at Rutgers. So um, I can go through some of my slides, but I have some information that's really more germane to continuing students and I want to share with you. I won't talk for the whole time. I'd like to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, so uh, when I stop talking, I, I hope any questions that you have about the financial aid process or filing for financial aid or, or any issues, um, please uh, ask the questions and we'll share with the group. So money matters. We all know that. I, I, I would like to share that I am in the boat with you. Um, I have a daughter who just graduated from Rutgers in May, and I have my second daughter who is a current student at SAS now. So what is it? So you're going to hear later about scholarships. Scholarships generally are academic. the free application for federal student aid and based on your family's economic situation their ability to pay there are some grant programs that are available to your family grants are free they don't have to be paid back 
You give them to the students, the student, students use them for educational expenses. There's no obligation after they graduate for grants. Loans, which are by far and away at Rutgers, the biggest of our financial aid programs. Most students at Rutgers uh, will borrow from the federal student loan program sometime in their career as an undergraduate. We have a, just under 60,000 students university-wide at all three regions uh, that are enrolled and about 46,000 students receive some form of financial aid. So the vast majority of students are receiving some sort of aid program here at Rutgers. And we have work study. And uh, federal work study places students in jobs on campus related to their majors whenever we can, but other jobs can be just office skill building and, and things like that, customer service jobs, uh, to give them an opportunity to work um, to earn some of their educational aid. Um, that is actually delivered to them in the form of a paycheck and they get paid every other week. And so it's not aid that is given out in the front that can be used to reduce the term bill cost because the student is actually earning that financial aid as they're working in their job. So the primary goal is to assist students in paying for college. So we evaluate every year, each year, and you know that if you file a FAFSA, you need to file it every year, your family's ability to pay. It can, it can change, and over these last three or four years, we've certainly seen that. We've seen a lot of families whose work situation, um, employment has become difficult, the ability to pay has, has shifted. Uh, we distribute limited resources in an equitable manner. That is, we have a finite amount of financial aid that we have to award. But students that are alike will get the same financial aid package, the same grouping of financial aid programs. And we try to, to, to provide a balance of, of gift aid or grants and self-help aid. The Office of Financial Aid administers academic scholarships on behalf of the schools and in undergraduate admissions, we do not select students for those scholarships. We don't determine eligibility for academic scholarships, but we do administer them and they are part of the student's financial aid package. So the principles of the need analysis that, that goes behind your FAFSA is that from the federal government and the state government's perspective, it's the parents that have the primary responsibility to pay for a child's education. Uh, students have a responsibility to contribute as well, so in the formula are the parents' contribution from income and assets, the students' contribution from income and assets, they don't generally have many assets, um, and that you're, you're evaluated in your present condition. So at the time you file the FAFSA for the, the academic year that's coming in September, we're looking at exactly at what happened to you this year economically. And we, and we try to be equitable and consistent, as I pointed out. So when we're determining a student's need for financial aid, we, we build something call, called the cost of attendance. It's different from your term bill. Your term bill is the direct charges that you owe the university. That's tuition and fees, if you live on campus, room and board. If, you commute for, if your student is commuting, it will be tuition and fees. You won't see a room and board charge. Those are your charges. A cost of attendance from a financial aid perspective has all of those components, but we do allow for books, supplies. If, if a student is studying abroad, we can add that to the cost of attendance. Dependent care expensive, if, if it's an undergraduate independent student with dependents of their own, we have them at Rutgers. We have almost every student of every type of situation that we deal with here because we're, we're large and, and diverse and expenses related to a disability. So if you have a student, we do have students that are here um, that are using wheelchairs, they need special parking, um, they have costs associated, they need an aid. Those kind of things can be built into what we look at when we evaluate that student's cost to be at Rutgers. So the EFC, the estimated family contribution, that drives your aid package. That is the thing that we look at to determine your eligibility. Parent contribution from in income and assets, adjusted if you have more than one child in college, they do look at that. And student contribution from available income and assets, and that is the federal estimated family contribution, and that is the key to financial aid. So cost of attendance minus your ability to pay is your financial need, and it is that need that we're, we look at to determine what aid package we're gonna put together for your student. 
So it be, this is where it would be for an incoming family, right? Because they're looking at different colleges. So your expected family contribution is if it's from the federal formula. It's portable. It doesn't matter what school you go to, that's still your EFC because it's based on your financial situation. So if the cost of school one, say they're Harvard, say school two is Rutgers and school three is a community college somewhere in New Jersey, the EFC is applied equally and so the need is going to vary depending on, on the cost of the college that you're at. So we have grants and scholarships, loans and employment, they're all need-based programs. Merit-based programs are the academic scholarships you'll talk to uh, about later at, at the school level. Prizes that incoming students generally bring from their PTA, their Rotary Club, the Kiwanis, all those kind of things, and collegiate scholarships. So there are a variety of aid programs out there. There are scholarship, um, like sort of national-based scholarships, and if you visit our website, you can jump out to them. And there is kind of this like sort of uh, not school-related money that is available in scholarships, but you have to be pretty, you have to be very proactive. You have to get out there, you know, and, and be searching those websites and be applying for that kind of scholarship money, but it is there. Independent student definition. We have a lot of conversations with parents and students about the student's dependency on their parent and that um, the student I'm not claiming the student on my tax return, so they're not dependent on me anymore. Or the student doesn't live with us anymore, they got their own apartment in New Brunswick. Does not matter. In the federal formula, none of that makes the student independent. Very specific, highly regulated. So 24 years of age, a graduate or professional student, as soon as the student moves from the undergraduate level to a graduate school, automatically considered independent. Married has legal dependents other than a spouse. So if you have, if the student has their own children, they're automatically independent for aid purposes. Both parents deceased or the student is a ward of the Court of New Jersey, a veteran of the armed forces, or on a case-by-case -case basis can be, de be determined by the Office of Financial Aid. That is very rare, and we're talking about extreme hardship cases where there is real you know, real split between the parent and the child. No contact, no support, no going home for Christmas, nothing. So there are very few students, fortunately, that, that fall into this definition of independence. But we get a lot of calls and a lot, most of it is, well, I'm not gonna claim my student this year on my tax return, so that makes them independent, right? It does not. So these are the aid programs, and we can go into this, but I, have, I just want to um, find out um, how many of you are FAFSA filers? Um, lots of you. And how many of you have filed your income taxes already for 2011? Well, not so many. Three, yay. Okay, well, uh, there's some changes going on this year. They are federal mandates, and so I'm gonna leave my slideshow because this is very important information for your family. Uh, we're required to select a certain percentage of our students for a process called verification. Uh, we would notify you uh, that we would like to see, in the past, a copy of your 1040, some information about your household and your, the number of children in college and your untaxed income and that kind of thing. Well, Congress has decided that a signed copy of your 1040 is no longer a valid document for the Office of Financial Aid. And the reason is because they seem to feel that since the advent of TurboTax and those kind of things, it's pretty easy to just create a 1040, uh, print it off, sign it, and send it to the offices of financial aid around. This is a national issue around the country. So um, the Senate and the House have decided that that is no longer going to be a valid document. So a family beginning this year with the 12-13 FAFSA, and if you filed it, I'll, I'll tell you what you can do. Um, you have two choices. You can use something called the IRS data retrieval tool. It's built in to the FAFSA. So the most important thing I can tell you is to file your income taxes while your students are in school as early as you possibly can. I realize it's very early right now. but. As the federal process moves along, and I 
been in it a long time, I would say in a few years from now, you're going to have to have your taxes filed in order to complete your FAFSA. So it's just a new way that they're looking at this. This is to protect the federal programs. This is your money. It is all of our money. It is taxpayer money. And so um, there was a feeling that this signed copy of any old 1040, and you know, frankly, we see it where we ask the student to get a 1040, and 10 minutes later, somehow, they wind up in our office with their parents' 1040, and you wonder, well, how could you have done that? You know, so you know, there's, there are reasons behind it. If you don't do the IRS, so you go into your FAFSA, it will ask you, would you like to transfer your tax data from the IRS directly into your FAFSA? It's electronic, you're not doing anything. You say yes, and it's going to bring over your income information. AGI, taxes paid, some untaxed income. It will send a set of code on your, on your FAFSA record. When we receive it electronically, we'll see that you transferred your data, you did not change it, you will not be selected for verification. You're finished. And that's national. It doesn't matter if your student's going to school at Rutgers or they have a sibling somewhere else. We're all operating under that rule. If you choose, if, if we select you for verification and you're not comfortable using the IRS data retrieval tool uh, for whatever reason, then you're going to be required to send us something called a tax transcript. It's not a copy of your 1040. You have to go to the IRS website and actually order one. Uh, it, it will substantially increase the time it will take us to get the completed paperwork and finish your student's file. Uh, it can take six to eight weeks for you to get the tax transcript back, back from the IRS and then you have to send it to us and then we have to act on it. So we are really highly suggesting that you file your taxes and that when you do, you wait. if you file electronically, you can go use the IRS data retrieval in 10 days. If you file on paper, it's probably going to take about three weeks. But once that time has elapsed, that you go back in to your FAFSA at fafsa.ed.gov, which you're familiar with, and you transfer that data over and complete your financial aid process. If we need other pieces of documentation from you, like information about your household, information about other students in college, we will reach out specifically for that. So this is very new. Um, this came out very suddenly. They do this to financial aid offices a lot where they put a reg in place like that and we're reacting to it. Uh, we're going to start communicating that to students, but most of the students at Rutgers are dependent students, so we're trying to alert parents because it's your tax information that's important. If you've already filed your FAFSA and you haven't filed your taxes, so you couldn't use the IRS data retrieval tool because there's nothing there. When you do file, you can go back in and you can update your FAFSA and, and still choose, yes, bring that over. We'll get an updated electronic record from the federal government about your, your information. And even if we've selected you and we see, okay, now you've gone in and you've used the IRS data retrieval, we will complete your documentation for you and you're, you'll be done. So we're just trying to alert you because if, you, if you're not going to be comfortable using that, you, you need to take the steps to find out how soon you can get a tax transcript. But really, the key to the whole thing is filing your taxes. And um, it's a little early for most people, but the best message I can give you is while your student is at school or your, you know, your younger children, whenever you have a child who is in college, those are the years where you really want to try to get your taxes done as early as possible. And then when they graduate, you can go back to doing it on April 14th if that's what you really like to do. I get it, but it's really to your advantage to, while they're in school to do that. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, because you're parents of continuing students, um, is another federal regulation we are now required to operate under. Um, in terms of measuring your students' academic progress toward their degree for financial aid purposes, uh, we are now required to look at all of the credits that the student has attempted and then, all of, as, and then all of the credits that your student has completed. And then there's a percentage. And as the student earns more credits, that percentage continues to rise. And so um, there may be students that were sort of on the edge in the old process who may bump over and have an academic progress problem this spring when we measure. We are required to measure once a year. That's not optional for us. 
And uh, that is really for protection of students. It's not really as punitive as it sounds. We have a lot of students that borrow a lot of money. And if students are borrowing money and they have no real chance of leaving here with a degree, then we're not doing the right thing by the student. Because a student who leaves with a lot of debt and no degree is in a very bad spot. Uh, a student loan, a federal student loan, can never be discharged in bankruptcy. That's the law. Uh, a default on a student loan will really set a young person back financially for many, many, many years. And so we do what we can to get out there and let our students know what their rights and responsibilities are, what it means to borrow. And a lot of students come to us, they don't, you know, they're not familiar with that. That wasn't part of what their high school experience would be, of course. Uh, and a lot of them really don't know the difference between a grant and a loan. So if your student is borrowing, they need to be reminded when they leave, they're going to be expected to pay those loans back. And if they don't, that's a very serious, very serious matter for their financial growth going forward. So we really want to stress the fact that um, they need to progress toward their degree. Uh, we have a culture at Rutgers that students like to register for a whole bunch of courses, see how they like them, and then take a W grade. And if they, a couple courses they don't like, they'll take the W and they still have the courses that they do like. In the past, we, we didn't have to look at that. Going forward, we do have to look at that. We're required to look at that. And so if you continue to withdraw just because you, know, you want to kind of shop around for classes, those withdrawals will start to count because they're attempted credits. And you'll be earning at a lower percentage that, than the student should be. So I just want to make you aware, if you get a letter from us in the spring, and you won't, but your student will, and I don't know if they'll share that with you or not. Uh, they're not required to. Um, but if the student gets a letter from us saying they're not where they need to be, they will need to make an appointment with their academic advisor. They're going to have to come up with a plan and submit that plan to show the F Office of Financial Aid that an academic person has met with that student and has put them on a plan and that they can achieve their degree. We're not going to evaluate the quality of the plan. We just simply need to know that somebody did. And then that student will become eligible for one, one more term of financial aid. And after every term, the Office of Financial Aid will evaluate whether or not the student is, is meeting the conditions of the plan. So it's just something that is new, it's something to be aware of. Uh, we're going to start communicating to students. But again, I don't know how the messages always get back to parents. We communicate with students. We're required to communicate with the student. So this is just to make you aware, maybe at the end of sometime in the middle of June, you might want to say, so did you get a letter from the Office of Financial Aid about your academic progress? If they say no, that's a good thing. If they say yes, you might want to ask if they'll share that with you so that you have some idea of what's going on. Um, and so I'm going to stop because I'm running out of time and I want to answer some questions. So if anyone has a question, sure. A change in family circumstances is a form you can find on our website. Let me go all the way to the end of my. That's our website. There is a form under our forms that is called a change in family circumstances. And it will tell you exactly what you have to do and what documentation that we would need. And we do see that a lot. Someone lost a job midstream last year. Or, you know, so even though their, their 1040 looks like they made more money, that money is no longer coming in. We need to know that. We would need to know that. Yes? You should always fill out the FAFSA with, with the copy of your 1040 that you submitted. That is the most accurate way for you to fill out the FAFSA. That, those fields will actually come back in a different part of the FAFSA. 
So you should just fill out the FAFSA as instructed. When you get to the data retrieval, it'll say transfer the IRS data. It doesn't overlay the data you've already put in. It's just that we know we're going to start looking at that instead. Yes, it absolutely should. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yes. Yes. Follow up to that question on the, uh, the data retrieval tool. If you uh, uh, input financial data into the FASCA uh, before you file your tax return, uh, will the financial aid office take any action with respect to the financial package for that student? Or do you wait until the, you get the formal data from the IRS? Well, it, w it depends really whether we select that particular file for verification or not, and we don't select every file for verification. So if you're not, if a student isn't selected for verification, they move right into the packaging parameters. Uh, if the student is selected for verification, we do not package the student until verification is complete. But if the IRS data retrieval tool is used, we won't select the student for verification. So that's kind of one way to know, well, if I just bring my, my file tax information over and let the financial aid office use that, you sort of avoid that whole need for a tax information at all. Doesn't mean we might not ask for other data like household size, but it's unlikely for a dependent student that that will happen. Uh, we do have some requirements from, from the state of New Jersey for students that are tuition aid grant recipients that differ a little from the federal requirements. However, our understanding is that New Jersey is also going to allow the IRS data retrieval to, to complete verification for students for New Jersey state aid as well. Yes, Dean Lord. Okay, let me repeat that because that's a very important point. Right. Um, haven't filed my FAFSA, haven't filed my, my tax form yet, um, well, what should I do? You should go in and you should file your FAFSA and you should say that I will file my 1040 because if you're working and, you're going, and you have to file, that's the answer to that question. I have not, but I will because I'm required to. Once you do file your taxes, and we, and if you file them electronically, which would be to your benefit, you can wait the 10 days. They're saying 10, you know, if it's not 10 on the 10th day, don't panic, just go back in through the FAFSA later. And that's what you would do. The FAFSA information would come to us, and then we would know, we would consider that your filing date. That's important, because there are some restrictions on scholarships about when the, fa the FAFSA is filed. So if you're not gonna file your taxes till April, you still need to file your FAFSA by March 15th. You can go back after you file your, your IRS data and still transfer that data to, into your corrected FAFSA and it will come to us later and that's okay. So don't not file the FAFSA because you're not gonna file your taxes. There are some people that can't use the IRS data retrieval because they're married and they're married not filing jointly. Well, that's not gonna do it because we need both parents, right? So if you're, if you're married filing separately, you're, they're gonna tell you you can't use it. The, the actual FAFSA, the message will come back to you in, in the form. Uh, Puerto Rican return, I don't know if anyone in, in this room, if that applies to anyone, but if you're filing a Puerto Rican tax return, you can't use it. So there are certain groups of filers that they cannot use the IRS data retrieval, but for most of us, it's there and available. Yes. Uh, not unless they're also considered independent for financial aid purposes. So they have to be 24. They have to meet that criteria. If they're dependent on parents that are out of state residents or foreign nationals, they'll, they're going to continue to pay the out of state tuition. Until, yeah, or, yeah, until they meet the criteria. 
They can't move, no student can move to New Jersey from Pennsylvania or anywhere and say, well, now I'm a New Jersey resident. If they're dependent on a parent who's not a New Jersey resident, they're not a New Jersey resident. We have no flexibility, that's, that's the state law. Okay, I'm out of time. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Okay, thank you everybody. We are going to now work, go into the break sessions. Joe Ventola from SEBS is here now. He will be leading the uh, SEBS sessions. The first SEBS session will be upstairs in room 202. The first SAS uh, program will be here, and then the second session they will switch places. The second SAS will be upstairs, and the first, second SEBS will be down here. And Douglas will be in the uh, cafe area in a couple of minutes. Thank you.
administrator for the School of Arts and Sciences, and one of the two of you come up here and um, we, there's three of us in the office. Um, Kate Cahill is um, senior program coordinator and Debbie Toady is uh, administrative assistant. So the three of us are the ones that take care of scholarships for the, all the SAS scholarships that are awarded to SAS students, as well as just taking care of your students in connection with various financial uh, kinds of matters. Um, what I'm gonna do is just basically go over this sheet, um, talk with you a little bit about a couple of um, other things that didn't make it onto the sheet because it, they came up in a student meeting that, um, that we had yesterday. A student told us about a, a Walmart scholarship that she got and we said, how did you find that? And she told us about where those were. And then we're just gonna take questions and some of them are gonna be, I imagine, generic questions and others are gonna be very, very particular. Um, and we'll try and handle those and we'll stay as long as we need to stay and uh, until the next program is supposed to start. So number one is, um, the stuff that you've already heard about, that the one major place to get funding to pay for college is through the financial aid system. And the program that Jean Rash just did, um, I learned stuff from it. Um, I think it's a very, very clear overview of the way the system works, what an EFC is, what a budget is, what a cost of attendance is. And those are useful, those are things that when we're meeting with students individually, I also show them. So they have some sense of how that, the financial aid system works. The second possible source of funds for the universe, for your students, are, is through the Office of Undergraduate Admissions. Ha, are any of you um, parents of first-year students? Okay, so some of you may have received, some of your students, some of your children, may have received scholarships through undergraduate admissions. These are the presidential scholarships, the Carr scholarships, Scarlet scholarships, um, RU national scholarships. That's the Office of Undergraduate Admission, Admissions that does the selection for those scholarships. And then the, the processing of them, as Jean Rash said, is handled through financial aid. These are all this also students, uh, many of them are, uh, are, are SAS students, who land in our office with questions about the scholarship itself or academic questions, renewal of the scholarship, and so on. So we once they get here, even though the scholarship came through financial through undergraduate admissions, we take care of them if they're if they're SAS students. The third thing is the thing that um, our, the, thir the third uh, item is the thing that our office takes care of, and this is called the SAS Excellence Award Program. This is a umbrella under which 300 or so different scholarships, some of which have enough money for one award and some of which have enough money for 100 awards, so there's a huge range in amount of funds available. We do award about um, over a million dollars in, in SAS Excellence Award. To be eligible for these, a student must be an SAS student, and that's uh, a really important detail. I'll mention just one student who, to whom we gave an SAS award, and she's now moved, transferred to SEBS because she wants to, um, to a major, I think, in environmental science, which you can't do at SAS. We let her keep the award for the second semester, but she won't be eligible for it subsequently. So you must be um, SAS, um, and the way the system works is that at the end of each academic year, students who meet the eligibility requirement, which has been a 3-7, it may be a little bit lower um, this coming year, um, are invited to apply. It's an electronic, with the invitation to apply is sent out by email. The application is submitted on, the, on our website. Um, and we start making awards in mid-summer and continue to make awards until all the funds for that year have been awarded. As it says, awards range in amount from $1,000 to $7,500. The basic award is $1,000. And if a student gets more than that, it's either because the student has, um, has financial need, and in those cases we prorate the amount in relation to the financial need, or because the student's been chosen for a scholarship where the scholarship itself, the specifications for the scholarship, say five awards of uh, $5,000 each. That's just a, one example. So there's a little bit more information on that website, and I'm happy to ask um, individual questions or generic questions about the Excellence Award Program in a second. The other important thing is that academic departments often have scholarships. And this is something that as a student, as your first year student decides what he or she is gonna uh, major in, it's useful for, that st for you or the student to look at the department's website and see what kind of scholarships the department is offering. I will say that most of those, I'm, 
I don't think it's true of all of them, but most of them are for juniors and sometimes only seniors. So for those of you who are parents of first year students, it's a little ways away to, for you to be considering, hoping to get something through a department, but it is useful to know what's there. And last of all, funding about information sources that are external to everything that Rutgers does. And we've given you some websites. The ones I would highlight are fast, the FastWeb one, fastweb.com. Um, each, each of these are some version of a, a database of information about scholarships out in the world, run by foundations, run by organizations, and so on, uh, or companies, and then a search engine. So the student registers, you should not pay anything for this, by the way. Uh, if, you find, if you find your way out to something where they're asking for $50 to get registered, you know, leave. Um, so you're not, you, for FastWeb, you don't have to pay anything. It asks the student questions about uh, background, uh, residency, um, academic major, career plans, et cetera, a whole bunch of different questions. And that goes into the system, and then the system pops out um, scholarships that seem to match. And the reason I say seem to match is because many students have told me that once they've registered for this system, they often get things that really don't match very well. Uh, most databases and search engines are, by definition, imperfect, so that's why that happens. I will also tell you that students have told me that they have, in fact, gotten scholarships that they learned about through FastWeb. Now, did everybody got a pen? Um, the first shot is, where's a student? Are you a student? What's the first lesson of college? <laughs> bring, <laughs> bingo, bring, go to class. <laughs> uh, what's the second lesson of college? Bring a pen. So, uh, good job. <laughs> um, I'm going to read you. This is the, um, the website that the student that we met with yesterday who just mentioned that she'd gotten a Walmart scholarship. And we said, hmm, how'd you find out about that one? Because I'm always curious about where people get scholarships. And it's, an org it's a website called, I'm going to spell it C, capital C as in cat, A, P as in Peter, P as in Peter, E, X. And the website is www.capex.com backslash scholarships. Um, it seemed like a really nice website, and we already know that the, the whoops, sorry. Uh, we already know that there's a scholarship that this student got. Um, and then the other one was, um, that's the CapEx one. Did you get it? www.capex2ps.com backslash scholarships. I don't know what happened to the other one. It took us to something called Merit Aid. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So, the next time we um, the next time we do this, oh here it is. Uh, www.meritaid all one word no caps dot com. The next time we do these sheets, we will add those two things on there. Um, there's also I mentioned at the bottom a useful book. Some of us prefer books to websites. Um, obviously, the thing that the website does for you is do the searching for you. Uh, this scholarship book is by a man named Daniel Cassidy. He's been doing it for 20 years. Uh, he updates it every year or so. Um, the difference, obviously, is that it, it's, it's got a very good index. So if you, your so child is majoring in history, you can look up history and see what scholarships might be out there in the world that a history major might be able to apply for. If you're a New Jersey resident, they have listings that are, that are organized by residency. It's, it's a different kind of searching, and as I said, some of us prefer books. This is a book that many libraries have, and certainly stores like Barnes & Noble. I almost said Borders, but I don't think Borders exists anymore. Uh, Barnes & Noble and those kinds of stores, Amazon probably has it as well. I'm gonna stop talking now, unless I've missed anything. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking now and give you folks a chance to ask any questions that you have. Okay, so it's a question about the Excellence Awards and um, a little bit about eligibility and a little bit about what the scholarship might actually be. So the eligibility, as I said, um, the past few years, we've used 3.7 cumulative GPA, so it's end of the year GPA. 
um, to screen for the invitation to apply. Why do we do that? Well, there are 20,000 students, 20,000 plus students in SAS. We have funding for about, I'm going to say 1,000-ish, give or take. So it doesn't make sense, for these merit-based awards, it doesn't make sense to invite 10,000 people for something where we have only 1,000 uh, recipient, uh, money for 1,000 awards. So that's why we, we have a cutoff. I will say that it's most, it's likely, because Dean Greenberg has been such a good fundraiser, and we therefore have a lot of new scholarships, it's very likely that we'll drop that 3.7 a little bit to maybe 3.6, which will pull in another 500 or so students. So eligibility for the invitation to apply is based on cumulative GPA. Just one more. Um, in terms of the award amount, the basic amount is 1,000. And um, if a student gets more, it's in relation either to having been chosen for a scholarship where the amount is, is required to be greater in part required to be more, and that ha has to do with the way the specifications of the scholarship are written, or because um, their student has some financial need, um, and we then try and adapt the amount in relation to the financial need. I keep hitting that thing, sorry. Uh, adapt the amount in relation to the financial need. Yes? Uh, 3.7 is not a test for a major? Nope. It's, it's the, the question is about what does, what do we mean by 3.7? And we mean a cumulative GPA. And cumulative means everything in terms of all courses, not just major, and everything over the course of however many semesters the person has been here. So if you look at a student's transcript, what you'll see is a term GPA, and that's the grades for the particular semester, and a cumulative GPA, which is the whole thing. Um, the, tr the transcript doesn't show anything about um, uh, GPA in a particular major. That's something the student has to figure out on his or her own. Uh, yeah. The question is, does everybody who was invited to, f to get a scholarship get one? Um, there's no way of knowing that in any particular year because we don't, we, know, we don't know how many, we know how many we've invited, we don't know how many are actually gonna apply. The third lesson of college is if you get invited to do something, to submit an application, you submit it. You don't blow it off. Um, so we, we don't know how many are actually gonna apply and we also don't know until sometime at the end of the summer how much money we're gonna have. We try to, to we award all the funds we have and in, most, in many cases over the past few years, we've been able to award everybody, but I can't, that's not something I can say up front because if we invite 5,000 and they all, all 5,000 apply, then, we're, then we wouldn't be able to award everybody. Uh, I'm gonna go for you and then I'll come back to you. Yeah. If, if a student received this scarlet card, presidential mm -hmm. The question is, if a student receives the scar received the one of the the undergraduate admissions uh, scholarships, Scarlet Car, Presidential, are you nationals not listed here? Um, those are renewable scholarships, and they're the, when they're awarded the scholarships, they are uh, given information about what the renewal requirements are. Um, for all three of these, the renewal well, actually no, uh, Presidential is three point two five. 3.25 cumulative GPA for the presidential. For the other two, it's 3.0, and the student has to complete 24 credits a year. AP credits count. So it's not that they get it, it's not a question about get it again, it's a question about what are the renewal requirements. And we spend a lot of time talking with SAS students who have these awards, um, it, re informing them of what those, that process is. And I also know undergraduate um, financial aid actually just sent out maybe two weeks ago notices to the students who are getting these awards whose grades are a little below what they need to be just to keep them focused, uh, shall we say, so that their grades improve. Because it's, it, we never take these awards away mid-year. That would not work at all. If they get it for a year, gets reviewed in June, um, and then either renewed or not renewed. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I have a follow-up. Okay. The presidential is for the very, very top students, and it's tuition, uh, it, it pays for everything except fees. So tuition, room, and board. Does it, if you get presidential, it's always everything? 
No. And the question is, if you get a presidential, is it always everything? And the answer to that is no. And that's because tuition and room, it's a, it's a stated amount that you get in the year that you get it. Um, but the tuition and, and fees and room and board go up a little bit every year. But it's a very good deal, <laughs> I will say. No. The question is, if you didn't get one of these undergraduate admissions-based uh, university uh, merit awards, if you didn't get one as an incoming student, you won't get, they're not, you, you're not eligible for it uh, subsequently. Yes. Let me answer that one. The question is, if a student got one of these um, undergraduate admissions-based, university merit-based awards, is a student still eligible for SAS Excellence Award? And the answer is yes. I will tell you a story about that, which is that in, uh, when, we were Rutgers, when we were colleges, I worked for Rutgers College, and we had a scholarship committee which had students on it. And at that point, we had a policy that if you got one of these big awards, you couldn't get some of this additional money. And that was in a time because, that when we had very, very limited scholarship funds and we felt that it was really important to make sure that we had funds for uh, students who hadn't already gotten one of these big awards. And the students on the scholarship committee came to us and said, that's not fair, because we, we got the, the, big, the, uh, uni the merit -based, university merit-based awards on the basis of our high school uh, uh, record and we get here and we get a 4-0, why shouldn't we also have access to these other funds? And we changed the policy. Um, so the answer is, um, if you're getting one of the university merit-based awards and you do well, well enough to be invited to one of the SAS Excellence Awards, you're eligible for it. Second question. This, the invitations um, in the past have gone out on June 1st. That's the date we aim for. We may be sending them out a little bit earlier this year, but they go to the student's Rutgers um, email address. And so again, the students in the room should pay attention to their Rutgers email accounts. Um, and we try the, whether or not a student, uh, information about getting an award happens throughout the year. We're still making awards. Um, we have um, a bunch still to do. It's because, again, Dean Greenberg has raised a lot of money and we have lots of money to award. Um, so we start right in August, right after the, the, um, the summer break, and, but we're continuing to make awards throughout the year. I think it's mid-July. It'll, it'll be in relation to when we announce. We try not to give students too much time to do this because if, if the t date of announcement if the, the deadline is too far f away from the date of announcement, then it sort of falls off their desks, metaphorically, obviously, um, and they forget about it. Other questions? Yeah. I don't know that much about them. I can talk about a couple of, uh, the, the English department has a few. The history department has a few, economics has a few. The specifications for them are, there's two variables here. One has to do with what the specifications are. If it's department-based, it's, it's about being a major in that department. But it might also say a senior major in that department. Or it might also say, uh, we have one that's for social majors, actually that we handle, but it's for social majors. Um, honoring um, Professor Gutman, who was a professor in that department who died a few years ago, and his sister and brother, I'm not sure, established this. And that one has to go to the outstanding senior, but the, student, the senior has to have taken a particular course. Um, the department helps us find uh, the, the recipients for that. There's um, a bunch in the bio department called, uh, Ralph DeFalco was a faculty member in the bio department, and a group of fac faculty members after he died established a scholarship, and the department handles that one, announces it. I think it's to juniors and seniors. So there's a lot of variability in terms of, of which departments have them, um, what the specifics are of those scholarships, and then the unknown that I have no idea of really is, is how much money is available. Some of them are $250, some of them are $2,000. The main thing is your, if your student, if your child knows what 
he or she wants to major in, it can't hurt to, or has already declared, it can't hurt to poke around a little bit either on the website or, uh, you know, the, the place that all of us used to put things like this was on bulletin boards in the, in the department offices. So that's another place to look. Questions? Yeah. Let me make sure you're, I'm getting your question. Um, so if your child got one of the university merit-based awards, he or she would be eligible for it in the subsequent years? Yeah, it is, those are renewal, what are called renewable scholarships. That means, and it, it's not automatic, the student has to meet the requirements for renewal, which, um, as I said a second ago, the presidential is a 3.25 cumulative GPA, the others are 3.0 cumulative GPA. In both cases, in all cases, you have to have a 3.4, sorry, you have to have completed 24 credits a year, um, so 24, 48, and so on. AP credits count, so if a student had a little less actual courses they took, but they had some AP credits, they would be fine. Um, and that, re that uh, review for possible renewal happens at the end of each academic year. And the scholarships are for uh, eight semesters, so it's the four years. Track which? <laughs> yeah. The, qu the question is about um, if your child doesn't talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of those. <laughs> um, if your child doesn't talk to you about how things are going and you want to find out about, I guess, what the status is for the scholarship, you could always call my office. The uh, phone number's on here. I'm not allowed to tell you anything um, in any detail at all about grades. Um, but we, the, other, the other way you'll know is the money's not, if the, if the scholarship isn't renewed, the money's not gonna show up on the term bill. And you can see that, I imagine. Um, so, but you're certainly welcome to call me. Other questions? Yeah, there's a federal law called FERPA, which stands for Family Education. Educational, I can't remember. Protection Act, something. Yeah, something Protection Act. Uh, Senator Buckley put it in place. And it's, um, it's a basically a privacy act for students. There is a way that you can be, that I would be permitted to talk with you about those kinds of details, but the student has to sign off on it. And I see the contradiction. <laughs> I do. Um, but. Yeah, I, I see the contradiction, but it is, FERPA is really serious. Other question? Yeah. What did he sign? Okay, so so let's say you called me. The question is about, a fo it's a follow-up on FERPA, and, and there's a, a method by which, which I don't know the details about, I apologize, um, by which a, a, a student can basically say to the university, I give my parents permission to look at the following things. Is that, is that a summary? Right. 
Okay, so if, you're, if you called me and said, I want to talk about my son's ex, I would say, I can't do that, and you would say, um, he signed off on it, and I would ask you to fax me or send me whatever it was, and then we would talk. Right. Yes. I'm going to plead ignorance here, um, which I, you know, I, I learned a long time ago. It's much better to plead ignorance. If you don't know, you just say, I don't know. I don't know what, I'm, I'm guessing that that was something from the student accounting office. Yeah, I think that's uh, uh-huh. Your term bill is due. I, uh, the one thing I would say is I think there's a difference between, there's clearly a difference between being your, your son or daughter giving you and us permission to share information, that's one thing, but it doesn't necessarily mean that, that the materials are gonna go to you. It means the materials are still gonna go to the student. Here's something too important to know. Term bills are usually due early August and uh, early January. They just are. And there's information on the student accounting website which I don't have with me right away. Does anybody know, know that website? The student accounting website is abcstudents.rutgers.edu. And all the deadlines are on there. And nobody will stop you from looking at that. <laughs> abcstudents.rutgers.edu. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Student ABC, I did it, I transposed it. Student ABC dot Rutgers dot edu. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Any other questions? Okie doke. Thank you very much. We're done. I'm a, we'll stay around for a little while.
Uh, I feel like uh, <laughs> modern technology. Uh, okay, my name is uh, Joe Ventola, uh, one of the assistant deans at SEBS and academic office in Martin Hall. Um, so I've been here a number of years. I've, I really enjoy working with the students, so it's, it's a pleasure to help your sons and daughters. So what I'll do today is I'll give you kind of the nuts and bolts version of um, uh, SEBS scholarships and you know how that works. Scholarships are a supplement to the financial aid scholar, uh, area. So you heard this morning, financial aid is the key way where students stay at Rutgers and the financial aid is a supplement where they have opportunity to get you know, more additional dollars. Okay, now I sent a link already to, your, to the students at SCBS, it just went out. And on your, uh, your, your, um, your handout that the parents gave you, that link on there is the link to, to what I'm gonna be speaking about today, uh, the current student scholarships, okay? So on that handout the parents are, gave you, that's the link. I already sent out an email to the students with that link and they'll also get more information, okay? Um, also the Parents Association as well, uh, they got a, a, that link uh, they're going to be sending it out to their 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 parents uh, members and things. So you also get it, you get it two ways there. I think yeah I think I can ask uh, Cheryl. I don't want to I want to make sure I get it right. Uh, but uh, Cheryl, we have a question about the parents. It is. Um, the, par the, the SEBS, uh, or the Cook Campus Parents Association, is for any student who is enrolled in SEBS, or they could be cross-affiliated with another school. We've opened it to those who live on the campus. So maybe their, their major is not on the Cook Campus, but they reside. Um, you do have to be a member of the Cook Campus Parents Association to apply for those particular scholarships, although there are four scholarships in that batch that are open to any student in Rutgers University. And those are usually um, academic-based, need-based, or someone who has overcome a type of challenge. There are two types of scholarships. Those scholarships that I just referenced, which are the, the general scholarships, the student fills out the application form, the student fills out uh, a resume, and they are also asked to attach their academic grades. Those are reviewed by a panel and then the winners are selected. There are four of those. Uh, there is no interview process. The ones that are by class, they range anywhere from $500 to $1,500 per year, are based on four criteria. Those you need to be a member of the Cook Campus Association. It's not open to the general Rutgers populace. And those are for students who, they are all interviewed, they submit a resume, they make a statement, they attach their grades, and they participate in an interview that's judged on academics, leadership, campus service, and community service. And I'm telling you what those scholarships look for in awarding their winners. It's not going to be the 4.0 student. It's usually going to be someone who's got a good average academic grade who's well-rounded, who participates within the campus, a couple sports, a couple clubs, they go home, they help their church, they have a job, maybe they landed an internship, um, but we're looking for well-rounded students. So it's good if you can um, join up with the Cook group, separate and aside from what you're eligible to get uh, from the regular university, it would help your student get an extra opportunity at the scholarships. Through the link that you sent, are joining the Cook group? Yes, yes. Or, or on your way out today, there is a table um, for Cook Campus, and you can get information in the application there as well. But the students get it all in the email. Um, Douglas has a table also. The gentleman who's here for Cook, you can get the Douglas information there also. And we have had some dual winners where someone is uh, 
Cook and his Cross affiliate. In other words, they're a participant in women's studies, but they live on the Cook campus. And they've been lucky enough to gain two scholarships because we don't put a cap on how many you can win. But the, there is information at the table for you. Do you know how many scholarships the Cook parents give out each year or are they going to be next year? Uh, they will be every year. And they give out uh, three per class. And then they have three general scholarships, which is the Grant Walton. And there are two others that are named. And those are for students, the, the top students in academic leadership. So we rank them when we interview them. And they're done by, um, by a board of panelists across the university who have some expertise in their parents, just like you. In fact, we invite the parents of our own membership to participate in that panel. The rule is, though, as your student, you can't interview your student. So if your student is a junior, you can't sit on that panel. So they, they range. They range anywhere from a $500 scholarship for the year. Uh, the highest scholarship award last year was classes on, on Cook, they could, their major could reside at Cook, because we have Douglas students who actually qualify for a Cook scholarship simply because they, they reside on the campus, or, or vice versa. We have, we have SAS winners because they reside on the campus, so do stop by the table and get the particulars from, from both the Cook and the, uh, the president of that association. Like I said, Douglas winners, SAS winners. We've had Nathan Gross winners. From from what used to be skills, uh, we've had a skills winner. They don't. I don't. You would have to go on the website that Muff and Lord talked about before, but to answer anything for that. But we have had students from skills cross affiliate. So, I, but I, you need to speak specifically to the um, school. Muffin can answer that for you. The one uh, who made the first presentation. All set. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, now what I'm going to speak about today is SCBS, School of Environmental and Biological Sciences Scholarships. Part of that is, is the Parents Association. Okay, so I'm going to speak about the whole, all of the scholarships at SCBS in the process. I work with the Dean Scholarships, and those are the scholarships that we award, and I'll tell you about those in one, one second. Before on our website, this is all clear, clearly laid out for students. It's very student friendly. They're gonna see scholarships that are departmental scholarships. That's, that'll be once you get into your department in plant science or wherever, there are some scholarships that are awarded through the department. There's also external scholarships as well. There's a link there for external awards outside of Rutgers, students can apply. I also send, uh, I'm trying to make this kind of real simplified for you to understand it, I also send external scholarship links to each of the students as well. Uh, and what those are, those are scholarships that Rutgers SCBS students have won in the past. So they have a pretty good chance of possibly winning again. So I try to narrow it down. There's a lot of external scholarships um, and I recommend students do try to apply to those, but don't get carried away and try to apply to hundreds of them. You know, you, those are, you know, those, those are open to everybody, but apply to ones that kind of make sense, especially the email links that we send. Now, the scholarships that I'm mostly going to speak about today, or really what I'm going to speak about today, is the current student scholarships. This, again, the, the link has been sent directly to the students, and each February, they have an opportunity to apply for uh, different scholarships uh, through SEBS. These scholarships are donors that have directly donated to the SEBS Rutgers students. So you might see a lot of different scholarships on a cereal box and so forth, Pepsi Cola. 
those scholarships are great, but what the scholarships I'm speaking about are earmarked only for SEBS students. So that's why we want students to, of course, apply. And one of those, I guess, is the parents. Now, what happens is there's one application along with some specialized scholarships, which, again, one of the, the ones is the parents, but the, the general application for a lot of scholarships is the, is the SEBS scholarship application. It's all on the web. The students get clicked right, you know, uh, right to it, and they fill out an application. They talk about you know, their aid and all kinds of things. And they also have to put together a mandatory statement describing their career goals or future goals and special circumstances, what they're studying, what they've achieved at Rutgers. So that application is something, as you could say, is already a learning process because you have to write statements for medical school, for graduate school, for, for employers. So it's a, you know, I understand it's a, it's a little, bit, uh, little bit of a stretch because it's some students that have never done but they have to put together a statement uh, for the committee. That application, along with your statement, we also ask, it's not mandatory, but students can also get a faculty staff recommendation. Again, it's all linked very easily for students. The scholars, the recommendation is from, for a Rutgers faculty or staff person, and it's, um, it's not mandatory. So if a student's coming here first year and you know, they're getting to know professors, it's not mandatory they just, to submit one. But we do ask that people, they ask to have, it, uh, uh, to have somebody recommend them that this, hopefully the student gets to know the professor so that the professor can write and you know, speak about uh, you know, a very good on the student's behalf. So all that, those application goes into the general scholarship pool, and the, there's the recommendation form is also clearly laid out uh, uh, for, for students as, we, as well. And that gets submitted to, uh, to our office uh, in Martin Hall. Along with that, you're gonna see a link, it's all on the website, called Specialized SEBS Scholarships, and that's the parents' uh, scholarship. There's also the Reich Scholarship, Hellier House, Warby Scholarship, Parker, and Batanzas. So a lot of our scholarships are awarded through that one application, but we do have ones like the parents of the graces enough to uh, donate funds each year that they do their, their process and interviews and so forth. So it's, it's also very helpful. The, the deadlines and the applications are all online. The ones for the parents are due right before spring break, and that's on March the 9th, and you'll see again the date. March the 9th. The general application is due April 6th. So March 9th, the parents and the general application is due April the 6th. So the students have plenty of time to kind of, um, to do their, uh, you know, to put together a real good app application. Students will receive, we have a, it's a very competitive, not very competitive, but it is competitive where students get emails from me and throughout the spring process, we'll say, okay, this deadline's coming up, so they are, they are definitely uh, reminded. Uh, Cheryl and, and Rich, when I send things to them, they also send it out to the parents, and that's what Cheryl's just talking about, about memberships and things. Okay, so let's take a step on, a little bit more on the application. What happens is when the application is submitted, what, what goes on is, Cheryl just talked to you about the Parents Association scholarships. The general one, the general application, they're gonna look at, of course, the most important thing is the academic grades. So that will be a big consideration. They're also gonna look at financial need as well and participation in different things in the Rutgers community. A lot of those are combined. All those three things get looked at. Some, maybe just the academics, some are, could be based on need. So there's a mixture of a lot of different uh, criteria through that one application. So I do recommend that students do apply for the general one. I also recommend, of course, the parents. The parents have been uh, very, very generous with our, with our students. So, uh, and implying, uh, it, it gives them that opportunity to, you know, uh, write about themselves and learn, you know, a little, you know, learn a bit more about, you know, how to present yourself through writing to the committee. 
The committee meets at the end of, uh, generally the parents meet sometime in um, uh, March through uh, April, and then our committee meets through um, at the end when the summer grades come in May, June, and July. Um, if a student does uh, are awarded a scholarship, a letter is sent to the student at home, and also it goes through the financial aid process. So there's their credit, there, there's a credit to the student's account for the fall uh, of, two, uh, of 2012 and spring of 2013. The scholarship, if the students are awarded scholarships, again, this is a supplement to the financial aid office. The scholarship is earned, so a lot of times the students are very surprised if the parents or SEBS or whoever gives them a scholarship, they're a little bit surprised in a good way. Uh, but the scholarship is earned on, based on their good work, their academic merits, they participated, they've done a lot of good things. In the scholarship application, it gives opportunity to students to write about their circumstances. They may be working or, or, or going through a difficult time or helping a sick family member. That's all part of the, the application and to put it down to what, you know, what their circumstance is and it definitely be, will be considered. If a student wins a scholarship, whether it be $500 or 1,000 or 1,500, uh, that gives them, uh, we know, uh, definitely help because everybody can use it and maybe then cut back on their work or something uh, and gives them a little bit more opportunity to participate in the, in the Rutgers community. After the students uh, are awarded, what we generally, I know financial, the financial part of scholarships are extremely important after the scholarships are awarded, that's a big part of our course. But I also would say too, it, it gives the students a little bit more confidence in a sense that, wow, somebody did notice a committee or faculty or parents did, did reward me based on my hard work. So I would also say it helps the students' uh, confidence and their, uh, you know, and how they're, uh, you know, uh, doing here at, at Rutgers. Kind of gave you the real nuts and bolts. Um, I recommend that students apply for scholarships each year. Every year is different. There's sometimes uh, they may win a scholarship, sometimes they will not. Sometimes they win or, or the next year they don't. Every year is, is different, but I'm always recommending students definitely to apply, especially the ones that, you know, especially the ones that we have, you know, through our, through our office. Um, the parents also do interviews, and I, again, this is a, uh, if you, we see it in the bigger picture, it, it gives them an opportunity to, to experience an interview uh, and um, you know, go through that process. That's not only gonna help students later when they interview for medical school and so forth. So all, we also see it, the whole process as a learning experience uh, you know, along with, you know, in, in applying for scholarships. And one last note, I'll open it up to any questions you have, is um, again, the emails go out directly to students. Uh, they have more than an op opportunity to apply. We have a good application return rate. Um, and also look for my emails for internal scholarships as well, so both. When you go on the website, it's all cl clearly laid out for students to apply and to follow it. It's not anything real difficult. Just a matter of you know, taking the time out writing a good statement uh, and uh, you know doing you know all the information that it's that it's asked for um, I think that kind of covers it uh, any questions it's not it's all online it's, we used to have yeah that's good memory we used to have the green sheet applications but now it's a uh, it's it's just online so students can apply um, and it's pretty, again, it's very student friendly and it's all geared towards helping the student directly in relationship, which it should be done this way, for the term bill cycle. So we know the term bills are due sometime uh, early August. When a student wins a scholarship, their full account is, uh, is credited and along with the spring in a lot of cases. A lot of times the classes are, uh, are split. I forgot to say one thing, I'll get it open up the questions is the, um, if a student does win a scholarship, well, one of the things that we do encourage our students to do is to thank the donor. They get a, uh, you know, some kind of reminder to say thank you. And a lot of our, most of our students send thank yous. 
uh, the parents are an exceptional case where students get to meet them in a luncheon to, to thank the donors. So the, thanking the donors kind of keeps the process going and also kind of completes the cycle. Um, and it gives opportunities. Sometimes some of the donors are connected to environmental areas or whatever areas. So it's also a, good, a very you know, positive contact. The donors are happy to meet the students. We have a, in November a scholarship event by the SEBS Development Office, <clears throat> and they have opportunity to meet the donors as well. So everybody, it's a you know very positive thing. The parents have an unbelievable program, the Rutgers Day weekend, April uh, 29th, right? Yes. And uh, where you get to sit down with the parents, and so that's also very positive. Um, any other questions? These are. The, the SEBS scholarships is competitive. There was a time where it wasn't a number of years ago, but it's, it is competitive. Um, we're looking at probably eight to 900 awards. Uh, some students can win more than one. These are even scholarship, uh, we have actually have a faculty scholarship committee that awards these scholarships. Some are different uh, 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 committees. Uh, the process is competitive. They're gonna look at everything. Um, and, um, uh, not all students win scholarships. What happens if we actually award, the committee awards scholarship, they, they'll send a letter and, and so forth. The scholarships can range from $500 to $1,000, $1,500, it all depends. Uh, I'm not sure that, well, we, we, last year we gave about, uh, I would say it's about 900 awards. Uh, for SCBS students. Yes. We probably had over 1,400 applications. And uh, now remember, uh, 
900 awards also means a lot of things. I mean, it could be a student got two $500 scholars, not 900 students, 900 awards. Yeah, sure. But I, I do, you know, again, it, there is no guarantees with scholarships, but I do recommend people apply. Like financial aid area is, the, is still the most important way to keep students at Rutgers. Secondly, is the scholarship part, uh, part is, a, is a supplement to that. So, um, uh, you know, as a student does well here, even if, you know, if they're hanging in there and they're, they're improving, I, 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 do, I definitely encourage the student, our faculty does as well. Um, uh, but there's a place for scholarships because it's, you know, it's, it's that little extra to help the students, whether it be $700 or, you know, so, um, you know. And yes. They go to apply for internships and jobs also. Any award, any student that we get here, put it on your resume for summer jobs, for internships, and as you graduate for the future employers. Yeah, those are good questions. Thank you. Thanks. All set? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. Yes, it's all online. Yeah, I got it all. Good, You're all we got everything. Okay, good. Yeah. So give me a call. Yeah, I will. Yeah. We'll Thanks, Earl. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Nice to see you guys.